You likely know a game engine is software used to create video games, and there are several options available today for developers, including one of the biggest names in this space, Unity. As a 3D engine, Unity can support many different platforms, a couple dozen in fact, and it has several other benefits as well, including what it brings to the metaverse, which is going to be the topic of today's discussion. Even if you're listening to this and you like playing games rather than making them, or you're not 100% sure what the metaverse is, I think you're going to find this chat fascinating. As we have on the line, John Riccatello. He's CEO of Unity Technologies. Good to chat with you again, John. How are you? Hey, Mark. Great to be here. Awesome. So look, not everyone who tunes into this program is super techie. Can you explain what Unity is all about? Sure. So Unity basically does two things. First thing we do is we make tools for people to make games or other, you know, 3D interactive experiences. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by tools, we're basically the paint set for the painter. Or in this instance, we handle everything from user interface to, you know, how something is rendered, how physics, how lighting, how characters move, how animation works. These are repetitive tasks that no creator wants to reinvent every time. Mm -hmm. So we provide an array of tools for people to basically make what they have in their minds to realize their dreams. They can turn their ideas into a game or to a car configurator using Unity. The second thing we do is we operate those. So what I mean by operate is like a website, every game or virtually every game needs to be hosted, which means it's on a computer someplace. A lot of times there's two players or five players or 100 players or 1,000 players. All of those players with whatever they're playing on, whether it's an, you know, it's a mobile phone or it's a computer or a console, they're interacting with other players on a server someplace. That's hosting. We provide for that. A lot of them need billing services or they need chat services or they need texting services. So different players or different users can talk to each other or interact with each other. And those are operate services that we provide. So think of Unity in the world of 3D, the world of game to the world of digital twins is making the tools that allow people to create what they dream, to create those applications, and then to operate those applications. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification and distinction. And how would you say Unity stacks up against other game engines? I know it's going to be a completely subjective answer, (laughs) but there are others, as I hinted at in my introduction. And to what do you attribute its popularity? So I think, yeah, you're right. It's a subjective answer since I'm I'm associated with one, Unity. How do we stack up? So there's certain things we do better and there's sometimes, you know, other tools that might be better for another purpose. In the sum of all of these things, I think it's fairly obvious that Unity is the most useful for the most use cases, which is why, you know, north of 70% of all mobile games are built in Unity. Mm. Um, about half of all games in the world are built in Unity and no other game engine is within a fraction of that. And then a huge number of digital twins or metaverse type applications are built in Unity. And then many of your listeners will have heard about VR devices like Quest or AR devices like HoloLens. And the majority of all applications on these platforms are also built on Unity. So um, how do we stack up? We're bigger in terms of the number of users by a very, very, very wide margin. Now, what attribute makes this happen? I really think it's two things. The first is we support more platforms than any other engine. And what that means is you can create it once in Unity and it'll work on a mobile device like an iPhone or an Android phone or it'll work on a console. It'll work on a Quest VR device from Meta. It'll work on HoloLens. It'll work on a Samsung device. It'll work on all sorts of things. And so creators don't want to pay twice to make something. They want to pay for it once and have it work everywhere. So that's one super important attribute. The second thing is, realistically, no tool set is everything to everyone. And there's a term of art here called extensibility. And what that means is it's easy for a creator to build on top of Unity if there's something they want to do that the engine itself or our tech doesn't provide for. Many other engines out there aren't so easy to build on. They're not so easily extendable. What this means is there are literally no limits because we provide a foundation, a great foundation for virtually any use case. All right. So Unity is versatile, scalable, and extensible, as John says. And now let's pivot and talk about the metaverse, which has been so hyped lately. What is it exactly? And how does Unity fit into this space? So first off, I'd give you two answers to what the metaverse is. The second answer I'm going to give you is exactly what I think it really is. The first is to say that it's one of the most overhyped concepts that 
I've been involved with in my entire career. Mm -hmm. um, I, I listen to people describe it in such hyperinflated terminology that it's lost all meaning. And they get confused. You know, at least for me, for example, Christmas is about family. And it's about, you know, coming together, you know, with my brothers, my sisters, nephews and nieces, my kids, my father. And it's important to remember what it's about. It's not about presents or ornaments or turkey or ham or whatever it is somebody eats. And it's easy to get mistaken that it's about presents and wrapping and ribbon and ornaments. I think one of the reasons the metaverse is so poorly understood is so many people talk about it being about AR or VR or avatars. It's really none of those. Those are the ornaments and the meals that people mistake for that which would be better understood another way. So now that I've explained that it's hyperinflated and confused out there, I think what it is is pretty simple. It's the next generation of the internet. Most of the internet today is 2D, it's photos or text. There's a little bit of video or a lot of video if you're looking at TikTok. It's lightly interactive, but most things you do don't involve another player or someone interacting with you directly in a meaningful way. It's almost never real time. What I mean by that is you consume a video or a photograph, but a video game, for example, the screen you see is a result of an interaction of uh, something you've pushed on your phone or collectively what you and other players have done causes that next frame to, to render, meaning to, to be shown. And so it's a consequence of user interaction, not just a user selecting a photo, but a user doing something that causes a computer somewhere to render a frame or create a frame or create a picture for you to see. There's a number of other attributes what, about what makes a metaverse application, or I would say most easily to better understood might be a digital twin application and how that differs from what we have today. Yeah, you've used that phrase a couple of times. If you can explain that, that'd be awesome. An example of, you know, use case that, that people have now for Unity is a number of airports around the world, but, you know, notably Vancouver, but many others, use Unity to create a complete digital twin or a copy, a 3D copy, a digital copy, of, of their airport. And then they take data in in real time, camera data or data from security cameras or data from um, cameras looking outside about when planes are coming and taking off and, and, and other situations to be able to see in 3D what's happening in exactly the moment of um, interaction or activity in their airport at any given moment in time. And off to the side of that, they can use Unity to simulate what might happen. It might be something around, you know, more traffic comes in, how they should shunt people to different security lines, or it might be an emergency situation. And, you know, there can be emergencies in airports. What are they going to do about it? And that allows them to see into the future against the possibilities and to plan for them and to set up better procedures to ensure better efficiency in the airport when it's just about traffic and weather and, and when it's about security to save lives. And so rather than looking at floor plans for the airport, or rather than looking at, you know, some data feed that says there's 37,000 people, you know, in the air about to land, inclusive all the people in the airport, they can see where these people are, run simulations, train, and yield a much better outcome. The operators of this application, they could be using a VR device like uh, Quest, or they could be using a computer. But what they're seeing is a 3D real-time simulation that is photorealistic. It looks like at all times, like they're looking through a camera lens at their airport from different vantage points. But in parallel to that, a great deal of simulation work's being done, data work's being done to run simulations, hypothetical simulations, so they can run their business better. Now, that's an example of a digital twin. It's a twin of an airport, but it's also a simulation so that airport can run better. Fascinating, John. And no doubt there are other applications for digital twins. So yeah, that's being done at the molecular level when companies are looking at, you know, challenges like protein folding and trying to solve the mysteries of cancer to, you know, make the world a healthier place. It's also being done in factories to, to run them better in airports. You know, companies in the fashion industry want to be able to allow you to try things on exactly against your body, millimeter accurate in your own home, when it might be easier to buy, you know, a, a suit at home than it would be to, to, to venture into a major retailer or a boutique retailer. And so I can give you literally thousands of these examples 
Um, people are using it for surgeries, brain surgery even. You know, it was unknown to me that surgeons in the past would have an MRI. That's a picture of what's inside inside your skull. But once they're operating, that's a flat picture off to the side. And they're essentially operating on Braille. They can't see inside your head. If they do, they have a singular camera. But what they can do is create a simulation, a 3D simulation of your brain, put a probe inside your brain and see how it's touching different parts of your brain exactly. So they can be more precise when they're dealing with tumors and other maladies. We'd really want them to be pretty darn precise. And so my sense is so many of the world's entertainment sites and websites will give way from their 2D reality, non-real-time reality, to a future where they're 3D and they're interactive and they're real-time. And that'll just enable better experiences, more productivity, more health, literally better outcomes across the spectrum of, of potential use cases. And I'm going to pick your brain more about the precision and the photorealism and how you envision people, quote unquote, living in the metaverse, hypocide, working, socializing, schooling, shopping, gaming, and so on. In a moment, we are chatting with John Riccatello. He's CEO of Unity Technologies. He served as CEO and president at EA or Electronic Arts before that, when I last interviewed John, in fact. What you're helping us do is separate the hype from the reality. You know, I think a lot of people on social media made fun of Meta, formerly Facebook, including Mark Zuckerberg, who he was rendered in the metaverse a few weeks back, if you remember this, and the graphics looked dated. I mean, it looked like it was something out of a 20-year-old video game that you may have published at EA for the Nintendo Wii or even earlier. Is this, again, part of the issue here? Is that what we're imagining the metaverse can be is just not anywhere near where we are today? Well, look, earlier I referenced in you know, a bit of a stretched metaphor, the notion of how an ornament or a bit of ribbon can get in the way of understanding yeah. the meaning of Christmas. That was a great analogy, by the way, to the frills of Christmas opposed to its true meaning. Well, look, I think showing them an avatar and then talking in the metaverse can be very confusing because I think it really doesn't make the right point. There are going to be use cases in these 3D internet sites, whether they're consumed on your phone or they're consumed on a VR device or on a PC, where an avatar is really helpful. And there's going to be a lot of cases where a an avatar is absolutely useless. And so it's it's one of those ornaments that gets in the way of understanding what we're trying to do. So if I was trying, by way of example, to use a metaverse destination or a digital twin to furnish my home, to pick out all the chairs and the colors and see how they go together and figure out, you know, do I have enough room between the wall and the chair? If I back it up, can somebody fit into the space behind me? I don't really need an avatar of me. I need a camera. I need to see as if it's like almost a first person game, but I'm looking through my eyes. I don't need to see my body. Right. So more like a, a Call of Duty opposed to a Fortnite. Yeah. Big, big, it just gets in the way. And if I'm trying to go back to that brain surgeon that is trying to so delicately improve your life by removing a tumor, what's his body doing in the screen represented by either a cheesy metaphor or a photorealistic avatar? It doesn't help. And so it's a singular case in a set of singular cases where you might want an avatar. You might want a chat application as an example where I'm chatting with you. And there are cases where I think that's pretty cool. But I think, you know, when, you know, people were, you know, might well have been making fun of you know, Matt, and I, I didn't pick up on that vibe, so I didn't, I didn't see that. If they were, I think it might simply be because clearly both Meta and Unity have the ability to make photorealistic avatars. And for some reason, in this case, they apparently chose not to. Yeah. And secondly, what's the point of the avatar? Is it just sort of looking at you or talking to somebody? What's, what's it doing? Mm -hmm. Now, if that metaverse destination is a game... And the game is about, you know, exploring a jungle and finding, you know, all sorts of interesting creatures and people and going to battle with those people. Everyone's going to want an avatar. But if the goal is to, and I've seen this, um, use a HoloLens to help help design the Mars rover and a bunch of scientists want to be looking at that Mars rover, literally hovering in front of them, photorealistic detail. I don't need a meta. I don't need an avatar in that. Yeah. I get it. And so I, I think it's just, these are just one of the many examples where people, you know, use an example and ornament, if you will, and, and they lose track of what the metaverse might well be about. All right. Now, before we wrap up, John, if there is a looming recession, looks like we're heading that way, how might this propel the adoption and expansion of the metaverse? Well, here, I'm going to say something a little counterintuitive. I think many industries and companies in these industries 
are looking at the possibility of a digital twin, which is another way of describing most metaverse applications. Right. And, and in, a, in a more crisp way that's, that's understandable and not so full of hyperinflated terminology. And imagery. It's ready player one. <laughs> yeah. So they see that opportunity as a way to engage their customers better, to train their employees better, to be more successful, more efficient, generate more revenue, solve more problems. And my sense is for those companies that have got a crisp understanding and those consumers that have a crisp understanding of what they're trying to do, frankly, I think a recession will be helpful because it will cause them to focus on delivering more clearly what it is they believe they need and what they want. And that's all the metaverse is going to take to be realized, is many of us realizing our dreams in real-time 3D interactive social media. Now, when it, it's, it's sort of counterproductive because you're counterintuitive because you'd imagine people would do less of it. But remember, if it makes their business better, they're going to want to do more of it in the face of, of, a, of a potential recession. And I think a lot of superfluous stuff is just going to fall to the to the side as smart, thoughtful companies will make smart, thoughtful choices, invest for real-time 3D interactive social when it makes sense for what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, it's an interesting take on it, John. It's It's not perhaps too dissimilar to acknowledging and appreciating that the pandemic, as horrible as it was, the silver lining in the tech world is that it helps propel the adoption of new and exciting technologies when otherwise we may just get complacent. So if that's a fair comparison. So yeah, we're, we're working on Zoom today. I'm using the audio of Zoom. Mm -hmm. You know, four years ago, we wouldn't be. And yeah. we all adopted a similar tool from a company in the Valley and a very smart team of people because this kind of communication is really efficient, really effective. Working from home or working from you know remote locations that was required as a consequence of the pandemic moved that technology forward faster. Yep. And I think a number of technologies and a number of businesses moved to you know five years ahead in two years time so while the pandemic was horrible for so many people and you know we don't want to celebrate that in any way shape for or sure. form it did move us into the future a little bit quicker yeah glad to see we're aligned there thanks so much for your time john riccatello ceo of unity the best place to learn more about the company and your work is simply unity.com unity3d.com or unity.com they'll both get to the same place all right thanks again for your time john good to catch up with you again all the best all right thanks mark